My name's Keith, this is Jeff, and I'll refer to him as Jay-Z throughout. Um, so let's begin. Um, I'm currently a development director at Optimizely. I have been an agile coach at uh, Yahoo and Salesforce, and I've been working in the software industry for about 20 years. Oh, look at that. Oh, one quick story. Um, who was at the Agile Conference in 2007? Oh yeah, that guy, right, yeah. So um, yeah, in this picture there's uh, Gabby and Carl Scotland, but we were, um, we, this is the, where Kanban sort of started in the um, open space area, so that was 10 years ago. We're back in DC, it's pretty amazing. So this is, I've been following along on the Yahoo groups um, for 10 years now, and um, I wanna tell you where we are at Optimizely with enterprise service planning. Oh, that's cool. Just so you know, Optimizely is a company that was founded in 2009. We're based in San Francisco, and we have about 350 employees now. Um, they were an A-B testing company. We were an A-B testing company when I joined, but now we're a, uh, a multi-prod company with uh, six different products. Um, experiment everywhere. This is our monster truck. No, we don't have a monster truck yet. All right. Um, when I first got there in 2014, it was chaos. Um, there was set... the. The story is that there were 17 engineers and everything was perfect, and then there was an 18th engineer added and everything collapsed. So for about a year, nothing was delivered, quote unquote. So of course, like all good people, they decided to go scrum, so they brought me in for that. Um, these were our teams at that point. We basically had segments, which kind of looked like Spotify tribes. We had different size teams. Some teams were small, some teams didn't have product owners. So we did that for a while. Um, fortunately, we're all co-located, so we just move our seats whenever we want, kind of switch teams sort of whenever we want. Um, but the important part there is that, um, you know, I'll just, there you go, oops, sorry. So we ended up doing two years, so we did 37 sprints and then things just didn't feel good anymore. Who's had that problem before? No one, there, I, yeah, at Yahoo Sports we did 100 sprints and things were a little weird. Um, but luckily in January of 2016, so last year, I came across this uh, presentation uh, on SlideShare about enter enterprise service planning and I ate it up. I immediately scheduled a master class with David about two weeks later, went to that, and then um, took some of those learning and started uh, rolling out um, Kanban and enterprise service planning to Optimizely. Um, but one of the first things we did was, we didn't talk about it at all, so do what you do now. Um, we were already, um, our culture was already good for evolutionary improvements, and we were already had a very big um, ownership model at all levels. So we just didn't tell anyone anything, really. We took what we had, and we just sort of started messing with it, tinkering with it, sorry. Um, but um, who's taking the master class here? Yeah, oh, okay, half the people. Um, basically, uh, on Wednesday, we did a case studies day. Everyone did that. And the case studies day, a lot of time there was a problem would happen at the company. There'd be a big event um, that would change the company. And fortunately or unfortunately, we had one of those about a month after um, I took the class. Um, we had um, a reduction in forces, about 10% of the people. Our product team was cut in half um, or cut themselves in half. And then um, the CEO became the chief executive product officer, um, which is really good for us because he's really great at that stuff. So, but that's what changed. So, but, so for about a year, um, we've been in this new model. We also switched floors immediately after. So we took that opportunity to build this huge wall of work. Um, the first thing we decided to do was, which I learned at the uh, Common Conference last year, was that you start as high as you can in the system. Um, and for us, that was in the um, product area because the CEO was involved daily. So we started with, we started to uh, combinize one service, and that was the discovery service, um, which I'll let Jay Z, our head of design, talk about. Thank you, Keith. So yeah, my name is Jeff. Uh, people call me Jay Z. Um, I'm the head of design at Optimizely, and I've been there for almost five years now. And I've seen all the transformations that Keith talked about, where we started out as uh, a group of a few engineers working on features one by one and moving to Scrum, and now uh, I'm moving towards Kanban. And my background's actually in product design and in front-end development. So I'm kind of new to this community and not really like fully trained on ESP or any of that stuff. But from a lot of my conversations with Keith and a lot of the presentations he shared with me, I've picked up a lot. And a lot of what I've been doing kind of falls into uh, all these problems that I've been hearing about here and what other people are doing. So as Keith talked about, we moved towards uh, Agile. And it worked better than us shipping nothing, but it was like still having these problems that I think will be familiar to this room. Um, for designers, they really didn't have space to do their best work um, because Scrum doesn't really define any place where design can talk to customers, do research, iterate and explore um, solutions. Uh, so it was kind of an awkward fit for them. We sometimes did like a sprint zero or like spikes, but those really were kind of like kludges into the agile workflow. 
Uh, same with researchers. There's really like no defined place for research. Like if design can barely get a sprint in, then research definitely has no place um, in in agile. So they didn't really know exactly what was the highest priority work to be working on. Uh, they weren't well integrated with the product teams. Uh, the work they were doing was kind of uh, random, whether it was actually high priority or not, or whether it actually had an impact on the product decisions we were making. So they had a tough time um, with with agile. Product managers, that's supposed to be a map, but my emojis didn't come through. Uh, product managers uh, also were having a difficult time because they were so caught up in all the um, process and overhead waste of Scrum that they didn't really have time to talk to customers. They weren't doing a lot of customer development. They weren't understanding their needs or empathizing with them. And this made it hard for them to prioritize work properly. Um, it made it hard for them to deliver the highest value uh, work to customers. And they were just getting too caught up in all the processes um, and like rituals of Scrum. Uh, this is also tough on engineers. So even though Scrum is made for engineers, it still doesn't work great because uh, if we aren't prioritizing the right things and they aren't delivering customer value, uh, and also we you know, got in this habit that I'm sure is familiar here of engineers and designers would be committed to a project um, at the beginning of a sprint, expecting to build and design it all in one go. And that doesn't work very well because an engineer will start to build it while designers are designing it. The designs might change uh, or they might find a different solution. And then they have to redo all their work um, to be able to match the, the designs. And so that leads to buggy code. It leads to deadlines being missed. Uh, it leads to unhappy engineers. So their work wasn't flowing that well either most of the time. Uh, stakeholders around the company, and this is supposed to be I forgot what emoji this is, but it was really clever, I promise you. Um, the stakeholders around the company, they also weren't super happy because we couldn't deliver with confidence. Um, or the dates we'd give or the sprints we'd say things would be done, they weren't done in that time. The highest value work wasn't being done, so customers weren't always happy. Um, and then also, uh, they couldn't get their requests done. They didn't know what we were doing uh, in the engineering org. Uh, and with bugs and quality issues, uh, they were obviously not happy about that either. Uh, and then finally, this is also bad for our customers. So if we're not delivering the highest value work to them, then they're not getting as much value as they could have uh, from, our, uh, from our work. Uh, and if code's buggy and not working well, then that leads to churn and customers leaving us, which we were having problems with a couple years ago. So <clears throat> I would summarize this as we had a process optimized for delivery, but not for discovery. So we're really good at writing code, but we weren't really good at figuring out what code to write. And this is where I started thinking about how can I make space for my designers and researchers to have uh, the ability to do the best work that they can. And <clears throat> this is where I came up with uh, our Discovery Kanban process. And I believe Patrick's in the room, and he also has a Discovery Kanban process. Mine is not exactly the same as his, um, but I didn't know what his work was when I started this like a year and a half, two years ago. So it's kind of a coincidence in some ways. Anyway, uh, I wanted to implement this process that had a few goals for it. First, I wanted to make sure we're delivering the right stuff to customers. At the end of the day, any process should be in service of uh, our customers and increasing the value to them. And so I wanted to make sure to keep focused on that while I was rolling this out. Second was I wanted to make space for design and research. So as the head of design, I was dealing with problems of my designers and researchers didn't have the room to do their best work. So this is an explicit goal uh, to make sure there's a defined place for them in our development process. And finally, I wanted to improve overall coordination uh, and alignment uh, with, our, with our teams and with our, our engineers. <clears throat> so I started with what we do now, which is this thing called the double diamond model of design. And who, who's ever heard of that? Yeah, only a handful of people. Yeah, I know Patrick has. I saw it in his slides. He actually has like four diamonds. But this is a really general um, problem-solving framework that has two diamonds, as the name implies. And basically, it splits out uh, understanding the problem from finding solutions. And what I like about this model of working is that it's a very general problem-solving framework. It really works for any industry from healthcare to finance to tech. Um, it's not specific to design or to digital products. Um, it's pretty, pretty generic. And it also scales up and down between problems that are big and small. So it works well for problems that are greenfield new product offerings, or you can use it even for like small little feature uh, updates and increments. So the way it works is it starts with a general problem area, something you want to understand more. Um, maybe you heard feedback from customers uh, and you don't understand it very well. So 
you move into this research phase, and this is basically you're trying to gather data about the problem to help you understand it. And this is where the diamond comes in. This is a divergent phase, meaning you're going broad to gather as much data as you can. You're not trying to filter or refine that data. You just want to get anything related to this problem um, that you can. So if you're a PhD student, for example, this is like being in the library, reading papers, um, looking at books. In design and tech, this is things like talking to customers, doing interviews, um, doing surveys, looking at product analytics. And then the second half of this is a synthesis phase. So you take the data that you have, and you try to synthesize it down into concrete problems that you can then set out and solve. And this is a divergent phase, where you're going to learn a lot about this problem area, and not all of it's going to be useful. Not all of it's going to turn into problems that you're trying to solve. So you converge it down to the most important ones. And this is iterative, too. As you research, you're going to start to do synthesis. As you synthesize, you kind of go back and get more data. Um, it can also be never-ending, which is what you see when PhD students are doing their PhD for like 10 years. Um, but in product development, you obviously have to time box it sometimes. So at the end of this, you hopefully have some specific problems or insights with which you can uh, make decisions or set out to solve problems. And this is where we go into the second half of the diamond, which is solution exploration. So the idea here is to explore as many solutions as you possibly can. And this is really important uh, in design especially because the first idea you come up with to solve a problem is probably not the best idea. You want to find as many different solutions as you can to figure out which one of these is actually best. This is another divergent phase. You're trying to go broad to find as many solutions no matter like how crazy or dumb they may seem. You're trying not to self-edit or um, ignore any ideas. They're all good at this point. And then finally, you refine them down. And this is the process by which you can look at all the options you have that you've explored and say, which one of these is actually the best uh, solution to this problem? And so for design, this diamond is very much things like prototypes and mock-ups and sketches. Uh, and refining is often like user testing, doing more prototyping, iterating. Uh, once again, it's convergent. And if you've done all that right, and hopefully you've validated this with customers, at the other end, you get specific solutions. And these solutions you can then actually build and deliver to customers. And this whole process is iterative. Um, it looks very like linear and like it's cut and dry, but it's really not. Design and research are very messy um, domains in general. And <clears throat> so once you explore solutions, sometimes you realize, actually, I don't understand enough about this problem. I need to go back and talk to customers more. I need to find more product analytics. And it kind of goes in, in loops. But this is a pretty good visualization of how the design process works. So my team was already starting to do this. And as you might have guessed, I basically took each diamond and turned them into Kanban boards. Kanban boards. There we go. I had really, really cool animations for this before in Keynote. But we had all these technical difficulties. So they didn't come through. That animation was OK, but it was really, really cool before. So each of these are Kanban boards. And this is what I started with. And I basically just slapped an input and output queue on each side. So there's a to-do phase where we capture uh, problems we want to understand better, research it, synthesize it, and it's done. And then same with solution exploration. We capture an uh, input queue of problems to solve. And then by the end, it's hopefully ready to build. So if I zoom out for a quick second, oh my, those arrows got really weird. Um, so. <laughs> If we zoom out for a second, uh, basically we have this discovery process on the left side where there's a problem understanding phase and a solution exploration phase. They kind of overlap sometimes. There's some loops in there. But what we're trying to do, and I'm sorry, the arrows make it really weird and hard to, hard to read this, so my apologies. But what we're trying to do after uh, going through this process of understanding the problem, finding solutions, is we want to have the output a finished solution that's ready to build and deliver to our customers. Uh, and by finished, I mean it's viable. People want to buy it. it. It solves a real problem. It's also desirable. So we figured out how to make it in a, or design it in a uh, usable way that our customers actually want and they know how to use. Uh, and it's also technically feasible so that we know we can actually build this. We know we can support it. And once we've done all those things, it can go through delivery really fast because we don't really have any questions that come up about like what happens if I click this button, for example or any product decisions that need us to go back to customers to validate. So basically, engineers can get this and start working on it and building it without being slowed down by any questions or lack of information or anything like that. 
And if we've done all of that right, then we will have shipped the solution to, uh, to our customers, and hopefully it delights them. Uh, and also, what's not visualized here is then that feedback of going to customers goes back to the very beginning to problem understanding, and we can refine from there based on the uh, information we, we learn from them after actually launching. Sometimes this customer data goes right back into delivery. Those are bugs, for example. Uh, sometimes it goes right back into solution exploration. Like if we hear that something is hard to use or button text isn't clear, we don't really need any more information to understand that problem. We kind of know what the problem is. Um, but there's loops in here that help us get data from customers and uh, helps us refine the solutions even more. So I started rolling this out. Uh, this is a prototype uh, of my board uh, like a year and a half ago. And I actually used this double diamond to figure out solutions to our process problems. So kind of a meta thing there. But um, <clears throat> rolling this out was pretty simple because um, we were going basically from nothing to something. So there was no organizational resistance, and none of the designers or researchers were against it. They're all very much for it because like, they didn't really track their work anywhere, to be honest with you. It's almost embarrassing to say, but it was sometimes in JIRA. It was often in the PM and the designer's head. Um, but it was not captured anywhere consistently. So the fact that we were moving into a model of, of tracking this work, and especially for researchers who had like, nowhere to track their work, um, my team really appreciated this. And when I ran through kind of like some prototype systems of this, um, it worked pretty well. And this is like the first prototype. The next iteration is like for one team with like two or three designers on it. Um, I have everything on one board, both diamonds. And then I moved into a slightly bigger board, expanded the teams. Uh, I kept iterating, getting feedback from my um, designers and from the PMs, and um, added change columns. I also wrote up acceptance criteria for what it means to go through each of these. Um, this is also just the solution side. The, the problem understanding board is in a different picture. Uh, and then we moved, as Keith said, up to the fourth floor. We got a bigger board for all this stuff. This is just the design side. We started using bigger cards to capture more information. And here is like the end-to-end -end, uh, panoramic of our, uh, of our system. So this includes the problems and solutions into all this in-development stuff. Um, and Keith's going to talk more about some of this in a little bit. It also has dreams at the very beginning, which is like mock-ups and ideas and cool stuff. So this has been iterated on a number of times and worked really well for my team, um, but really the linchpin of it is uh, our planning meeting, or in the ESP parlance, it'd be a replenishment meeting. So every Monday morning um, at 10.30, my designers and researchers and PMs, uh, and then also some of our tech leads, uh, our CEO, who's that guy? Um, CEO, CEO comes sometimes. And every morning we, or sorry, every Monday morning we get together and we pull work through the system, we review the status of every item, uh, that's on the board, and then we pull in new work um, as work finishes up. And the great thing about this meeting is it's a place where, it's actually the only place where all the designers and the PMs and researchers come together to discuss what are, what's the work we're doing, what's the priority of it, is that really truly important? A lot of cross-team dependencies get hashed out here, a lot of asks of other teams happen here, um, and in general, my team has a better understanding of um, who's doing what and what's most important. And so the board by itself would be OK, but really the most important thing is the conversations that it facilitates. The fact that it's physical, it's really big, everyone can stand around it, everyone can see what people are doing, uh, helps the whole team come together and align on what the priorities are. And it's also great being physical because anyone can walk up to it at any time and look at who's working on stuff, talk through it, uh, discuss whether it's actually important. It's great for candidates that we bring through because they can see what our process is like and what we're working on. It's great for the rest of the org because when they come up to our floor, they can just take a quick look at the board and see who's doing what, um, what we have coming down the pipeline. Um, and all those things are really awesome, like way more awesome than a, a software tool because we have a shit ton of tools and it would just be another one in a whole long list of them that someone doesn't look at. They wouldn't go on their computer to see it. Um, they'd have to ask people for links to it. And having it physical just really helps um, bring everyone together and makes it a lot more accessible to the entire company. And that's also an advantage that Optimizely has is we're almost all co-located in San Francisco. So I recognize this doesn't really scale to remote offices um, or to other people who are outside of here. Um, but for us, we take advantage of the fact that we are in one office and use that to its fullest extent. 
So at the beginning, I said I had a few goals that I was shooting for with uh, this discovery process. And so I want to kind of go through each of them and just see like how I did reaching them. And I'm going to start from the bottom. And so improving coordination and alignment. So since I rolled out this process over a year ago, our throughput has doubled. Um, we were getting a lot more work done, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, a big one is that by having a, a design process um, formalized a bit more, it's encouraged people to understand the problem before jumping into solutions. Meaning something I saw my team doing a lot was um, a PM and a designer would have a vague idea of what they thought the problem was. The designer would immediately start designing mock-ups without really going deeper to understand what problem are we solving. They'd show that work at like sprint review or maybe at stand-ups or in an ad hoc meeting. And then the PM would say, well, what about this use case? And the engineer would say, well, what if the customer does this? And they'd say, oh, we have to rethink that and go back. And basically what's happening was scope was expanding. The use cases weren't um, clear. They weren't defined. And all of that could have been done up front without doing any design work or any mock-ups or prototypes. Uh, it's much faster to be able to talk through like what the problem is, get data on it, define the use cases up front before jumping into finding solutions to those. And this process has helped encourage that. And also the reason that I know that I even throughput's doubled is I maintain a diligent spreadsheet of all the dates for each of the columns and all the work items in progress um, and calculate how long they each take. So I have a number, I have a bunch of spreadsheets, yeah, for like throughput and cycle time and all that fun stuff. Um, another big reason that alignment coordination has improved is because we saved dozens of hours of meetings per week. Uh, and the reason I know that is because before this process came out, there was a lot of meetings that I was getting pulled into asking, when is a designer free to work on blah, 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 like some project? Um, who can we get to do that? PMs and designers were talking a lot about like who is doing this project, which team, which designer. And there was a lot of overhead of meetings to decide who's doing what. And that's because there wasn't a place where designers and PMs came together to discuss those things. And since I've implemented this process, I personally have seen a lot of meetings removed from my calendar because I don't have to have ad hoc meetings about who's doing what anymore. It all happens on Monday at 10.30. And this is also great for teams that don't have a dedicated designer. Um, sometimes there's a team that has a design asked once or twice a quarter. And we have room in the system for that and a place where they can come and advocate for what they want. Uh, and so I don't have to get pulled into extra meetings because of this. Um, the PMs and designers don't have to get pulled into extra meetings. I basically refer everyone to the uh, Monday morning meeting, and we talk about it there. So coordination alignment feels a lot better because everyone talks together in a room about it. Now, for making space for design and research. I do a lot of retros with my team to get uh, feedback on how things are going, uh, including the PMs and uh, designers. So these are some quotes. It's rewarding to see work move through the pipeline. Great way to keep track of your own work. Great visibility on what other designers are working on. And my favorite one, so much easier than using slash remembering to update Jira. I don't know if you know, but designers really don't like Jira at all. So uh, everyone really likes having this, this physical board. Uh, and in my one-on-ones with people and in my ad hoc surveys with them, just asking how things are going, do you think you have more space for doing your best work? Uh, is research well integrated into the process? Uh, overall, I feel much happier. And so another reason I know this, that they have space, is because we got to this point where work was moving through this discovery process. And then over here, on ready to be built, we have a big, big backlog of stuff to do. Now, this obviously is a problem with flow. I'm going to have Keith talk more about that in a little bit. But for my team, it's great because it shows that uh, work is moving through quickly, and it's moving through more quickly than engineering can get to it, which gives them more space to do better work because they aren't under the gun to get mock-ups or designs ready for engineering to build. And basically, the phrase blocked by design has completely gone away from uh, any conversations, which is fantastic because back in Scrum, we'd hear that a lot. Oh, the engineer can't start that because we're blocked on design. It's my least favorite phrase to hear ever. And luckily, it's gone. Um, and it's also a great tool for saying no. Because we have a board where it tracks the work, it's easy to walk up to it and say, OK, are these things actually the right priorities? Are these the right things to be working on? Is there something higher priority that we should be um, than taking something else off the wall to work on? And my favorite story about this is a few months after um, I rolled this out, the CEO came up to me and he said, hey, there's this project that I'd really like a designer to work on. 
Uh, it was like building some feature based on some customer conversation he had. And in my head, I was like, I know for a fact that is super low priority. We should not be doing it. But I didn't say that to him. Instead, I was like, look, let's walk up to the board. Let's talk through what these priorities are and see if the thing you want done is actually higher priority than what we're already doing. And so we walked to the board and we looked at, okay, Zach's doing this, Silly's so doing that, and so on. And then he said, okay, yeah, I can see those are, those are the right things we should be doing. We shouldn't reprioritize any of this. And he's like, I, I can find someone else to do this maybe. Thanks. And he left. And that was it. It was this great way of saying no, but without having to say no myself. He could see on his own that we were doing the right things already. Uh, so as I said, designers, researchers overall are happier. They have space. So that has been great for my team. And finally, the hardest one of all, deliver the right stuff to customers. So this one's tougher to measure in any objective way, but a story around this that I think illustrates we're moving in the right direction is we have a company objective this year to use experimentation to bring our vision to life. And basically what our CEO means by this is he wants to look at new product offerings and new opportunities in the market and try to deliver something um, to those. And the key result he's looking for here is 50 customer interviews. And there's actually a couple others, but for the point of this story, this is the only important key result. So the reason this is a really interesting key result is because had we done this a uh, year or two years ago, what the objective would have been would say, launch this new product offering by the end of the year. And the key result would be like, it's launched. And what would have happened is we would have put a team of engineers, a couple of designers, and a PM or two on this project and would said, start coding, like build this new product. But we didn't have any customer validation of what we're trying to build. We didn't have a clear understanding of the problems or the use cases we're designing for. Uh, engineers were immediately asking for mock-ups and um, product decisions from our PMs and from our designers. But none of that was known yet because we hadn't done any uh, customer validation. And that makes the work go slower. It makes design and PM feel behind. Uh, engineers feel like they're slow and that they should be coding when they're not. And leads to buggy code. And the reason I know we would have done this is because we actually did do this uh, two years ago. We had this goal of launching a new product that wasn't validated in the market in any way, that really didn't have clear use cases, and that had a team that was put on it from day one with no customer understanding, no use cases, and uh, no understanding of what they're doing. But they were trying to code and build things and design things all together from the, from the start. So the fact that our company has moved from an objective of like launch this product and putting a team on it to one where the key result is actually let's validate that there's problems here and figure out what the opportunity is before committing to actually building anything is really validating to me that we're moving in the right direction of getting customer data um, you know, used when we're doing product development. So overall, this process has been really great for my team and for the PMs. Um, and I also hear people talk about discovery in um, planning and strategy meetings where sometimes a new feature or idea comes up and we're trying to prioritize it and we'll say, well, is it in discovery? Do we understand the problem well enough yet? Do we need to do more research? And that's very validating for me that like some of these, these words and these terms and this understanding of what design does and how to build better products is starting to kind of seep out through the organization. And so... Everything was going well, but as I referenced earlier, we had this impedance mismatch problem, which is something I, I took from Patrick. Um, basically, discovery was not flowing smoothly into delivery. And this is when I started yelling at Keith quite a bit that he was doing his job poorly, and that he needs to fix up the engineering side of the house. And now I'm going to give the mic back to him to defend himself. <laughs> Thanks. That's very well done. Thank you. All right. Um, what Jay-Z is talking about is that mess over there, but I don't feel that. Um, bad about that, because um, it didn't start that way. Originally, we, were, we had designed two different services, and we have one service flowing into the other. The reason that the discovery service was important to us is because the CEO was involved, and we were training him. We were bringing him along our journey. Like I think Rodrigo said before, but you need data and a narrative. And over the year, by him attending these meetings, um, he saw the value of what we were doing in this particular service. So then we, st um, yeah. So it was two different services, and then we put it together. But what's really interesting to me is as Jay-Z was killing it on the discovery side of the board, I was a lot more interested of the delivery side. And because this represents the other services we're flowing into. And by putting this up on the, the board, we were able to um, get these other services um, going. So on the right side, you see there's like a small beta, a private beta, ready for um, delivery. And then um, 
the release date. So apparently, there's two phase commit, apparently. I found that out today. But we do have one as well, and it is at this line right here. When we say it's ready for it, they can decide, marketing can decide to pull it in or not. If it doesn't go with their story, they leave it alone. Um, what you have over here as well is, and we do have other services, they're not as fancy as ours because they're in Jira. But um, education is running through here, and they have a really quick turnaround time. The product mar marketing managers are going through here. They're the ones kind of controlling this here. Um, we have marketing automation, which does the emails and the, um, all the website updates and all that stuff. They also have a Kanban system going, so we know how long the, the median is for all these groups. We also know what the average is, so we can kind of figure out what the long tail is, what the, the K value for these things are, so we know which our big system risks are, which is really cool. Um, let's see. So this is just one example of another physical board. Again, most are in Jira, but this is the customer operations and strategy group. This is their original board from about six months ago. And the reason I put this up here is to remind myself to tell you the story of, is it true? Yeah, that's right. This was our big launch date for our six products. Um, so we knew that six months, nine months in advance. So um, at this point, um, we knew what had to be done by August 1st. And we knew that they were the, um, the bottleneck of the system. So we made sure that, they were, that we were always um, putting work in front of them so they were never um, starved of work. So we used that to mitigate our risk against hitting the state. And that, um, that was very successful. Um, and we knew these numbers because Jay-Z there is looking at all the dates. In fact, we actually had one class, of, we had, uh, an, uh, let's see, we call it strategic customer, but it was really a fixed date class of service. It's for about 15% of our work. And that work went through twice as fast as all, as all our other work. And the CFO loved quoting that because we knew it was like 17 days to move through the discovery side and then, I don't know, a month to get on the uh, delivery side, which is fairly quick. Um, What's really cool about the fixed date work is now we just we just made our biggest contract ever or whatnot. And so it's really cool. We have a company all hands and the engineer raises his hand. How many fixed date commitments are on the contract? And, and they're like, none. Okay, how many fixed date commitments do we make? And it's none. So it's really neat that um, through this process, we've learned that um, we, we try to avoid fixed date commitments when possible because we want to be able to select the work ourselves and sequence it appropriately for the best value. And our founder even said, I want you to know how much we appreciate the work you do that enables us to deliver with confidence, which is really neat because that's kind of what ESP is about, is being able to make decisions with confidence. Um, so that was downstream from us, and we involved the other go-to-market forces, like, again, education, product marketing, sales enablement, um, and the marketing automation team. But we're also working on upstream um, Kanban, apparent, apparently. That's what it's called. Um, this was, we have this here I show you in the dream sequence before we get to define. This is supposed to be discover. I have this messy board to show you how messy it is, the work that we were um, looking at. But what we discovered was there's strategic customer work, there was product strategy, there was our CEO, there was a red account process, and there was product features. Um, we were trying to capture these and then evaluate them very quickly. This was very quick, just before we'd even put them into the, um, into the discovery process. Um, but this capture model has allowed us to, um, to shape demand better because we know that work out here takes a while to actually get delivered all the way end to end. So we know that our customer lead time is fairly long for many requests. But once it is in the system, once it gets into discovery, and then once it gets through delivery, we're pretty, um, we, we know pretty well. We can probabilistically forecast what we're going to deliver, which is really neat. So this, oh, cool. We sort of caught up. All right. All right, cool. So I look at this pretty much religiously every week. I, that one deck I showed you before, I look at what the meetings are supposed to be all the time because our meetings aren't quite there yet. And I want to uh, show you kind of how we've evolved over the year. So we had fancy automation. All right, cool. So this is our version of it, except that when I discovered that we weren't doing any operations reviews or risk reviews. So basically, I realized that we weren't really improving the system at all. So this is about a year ago, so January, so a year and a quarter ago. Um, and then I was like, OK, well, we're doing Scrum, so does that map? Ish, not really. But sprint planning, it's kind of like your plans for meeting. This, maybe. It depends how well the teams are doing. And we were doing quarterly release planning, which um, was valuable at the time to create trust among the groups and also more decide what not to do than what to do. Um, but so then we evolved it. And then we created those meetings, which is really cool. Um, except that I created them in our group, which is the Design, Engineering, and Product Organization, which we called MOPED, which is Managers of Product Engineering and Design, because clever names make people do stuff. Um, and the risk review, which was Jay-Z, uh, Pam, and Deho, and we meet weekly, just to like, how do we do what we're trying to do here? But then I realized that these were sort of the wrong meetings. Or the, and I realized that MOPED was actually a service delivery meeting. Uh, um, which was more focused on adept as a service, whereas we have a weekly executive staff operating review now. Um, we have one room, 
that has all the data on the walls across all the different services from sales to marketing to uh, what our delivery rate is. And then we also discovered, well, I figured out, I had Dan over here trying to do work in the improved system, but he should have really been over here. I mean, he was obviously here, but now we've set up the discovery planning meeting that Jay-Z runs as well as our product reviews, which are basically replenishment meetings because all he wants to do is weigh in on what the next thing an engineer is going to work on or the next thing that um, we're going to look into. Um, so that was really interesting to find out that I had been trying to play the players wrong and that our meetings are evolving. Also, what's fascinating is we're running really fast. Um, our, th these are all weekly. Weekly, weekly, weekly. That's eh, quarterly. Um, and this one is kind of bi-weekly uh, weekly as well with product reviews um, bi-weekly. Um, and we've left the teams alone. This is the getting things done um, group here. One thing is that our delivery planning has fallen, ap uh, fallen apart, as Becca knows. Um, but basically, um, what happened there was everyone wants to, people are very reticent to go as fast as we want to go. So we have, we got rid of quarterly planning only so that they couldn't default the quarterly planning. So um, the vehicle we're really planning is a weekly and a monthly cycle at this point. Um, it's just not as perfect as I would like at this moment. So that's what we're working on. So Pam, who took uh, one of the two ESP trainings, I think it was in February, why not? She said, my, my mind is blown. You actually managed to sort of, I appreciate that, implement ESP. The class is super theoretical, so what the, the, so pretty amazing how you're executing on it. I'm super impressed. It's funny, because she's not um, trained in Agile or program management or whatnot, um, but she's amazing at it. But like, the fact she thought the class was theoretical is kind of funny, because I thought it was actually pretty pragmatic. Um, but, like, I, but being in all the meetings and being with the product team and the way they talk is we didn't train anyone. We didn't tell anyone what we were doing. I mean, and when we tried, they just laughed at me. I showed them a cost of delay curve once. I had 20 people, including the CEO, laugh at me. I had no idea. What, that was like a two-minute conversation. I just moved on, didn't tell anyone what we were doing. And like, what we really did is when I'm looking at these different meetings, um, um, like again, like I said, I go back to that slide deck all the time. Like These are some discussions you could have in these meetings. I'm like, oh, we're doing this one. We're not doing this one. Maybe we could try this one this week. Um, so I'm really trying to refine the existing meetings we have without forcing a new set on people. And it's also more natural for them just to show up and have a new agenda, like different items on the agenda. So this has been working really well for us. Again, we're going really fast. It's very high tempo. Um, so I just want to show you one other thing, and then we have time for a few questions, is we've done a lot with the services that get our product. Um, again, like the go-to-market side, but we're working now more with the other groups, um, such as recruiting and whatnot. Um, and what we had here is this is our SVP of engineering, as well as all the engineering management and the recruiting team, which is really neat. And they have their board, which is really cool. I mean, we went from not hiring anyone for multiple quarters to hiring gangbusters right now, um, which is really important because you want to increase your capabilities. Um, but this is really cool. They came up with this themselves, but I have no idea what any of these things are. I'm not hiring. Uh, there's recruiting phone screen, technical phone screen, on-site. I don't know what AFO is. <laughs> Off route accepted. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so, I mean, they, um, let's see. But again, they meet every day around that board. What, I think the point I'm trying to make here is that our whole company from top to bottom is involved in some sort of daily meeting where they're working on our biggest problems and uh, trying to, um, to work in flow. Uh, so this has been super amazing. And with that, um, anyone, anyone from San Francisco? Anyone know where that is? Yeah, that's in the upper eight, but listen to this wall. Uh, what this wall has allowed us to do, because the CEO walks between his desk and, his, um, and the room that he sits in a lot, about 10 times a day, so he's always walking by it, looking at it. But we've also been, the CFO, our CEO, goes around and like shows all our customers in, shows them what we're working on. This wall has allowed us to have many, many conversations. So even though a lot of our work, and Jay-Z is making fun of me, but all the engineers are inside of uh, in Jira. Like, we didn't want to rebuild what their work was, because that was going to find. There's a lot of things to capture in Jira. That's where we get our numbers from on the, engineer, on the delivery side. But this wall has allowed us to have all the conversations we need to have and to implement the Kanban cadences that we need to um, become a successful company. And with that, questions? You can clap. Thank you. Thank you.